Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. My guest is engineer, producer, and pro audio goddess, Lenny Spent. How's that? Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> sure. I've, you know, I've been called worse. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't we all in this industry? Yeah. Yes. But Lenise's credits are wide and varied. Let's see. There's at least one Super Tramp album. Only there one. There's only one? Only one okay. that right. I worked on, yeah. Okay. Super Tramp, um, Steely Dan's Asia, which is a bit of an accomplishment, yes, I would thank say. Thank you. And, and I did and a bit of Gaucho. Did you as well? Okay. I did about a third of Gaucho until uh -huh. I... I I bailed to work on Breakfast in America. <laughs> ah, yeah, that's that's part of the problem. Yeah, you know, there was they, so much going on. You know. Well, I had done my time on Asia. I did ten and a half months on that. So you did two songs. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, the entire album, um, and that wasn't even all the mixing. We only mixed one song here, mm -hmm. Peg, uh, and I'm not even sure if that's the one that went on the record because Al Schmidt said, well, I mixed that. And I went, oh, well, hmm. and we mixed it here too. So I don't know which one went on, okay. but that was the only one. Every He did all, all the rest of the sun in New York, but and 10 I and should, a half months. I should, probably, um, I should probably state for the record that we are it's, at does that have Lip Rouge on it? Village Recorder yes. with Lip Rouge and everything. Yes. yes. Um, yeah. no. And I Ooh. won't put it there. No, I won't put it there. Oh, Oops. whoa. We would never do that. Mm -mm. Oh my goodness! Actually, I always used to laugh. The uh, yeah. one of my bosses at uh, a studio that no longer stands mm -hmm. um, used to put his coffee cup on the faders all the time. Oh, and all geez. of you know, every time one of the techs was in the room, you could see this look on their eyes. Yeah, you know, okay, it's 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 your five hundred thousand dollar console. Yeah. You can do what you want. Yeah. Okay, so let's get into just a little bit of history. I don't want right. to. I don't want to know your whole life story because I, I don't think there are no, things we should publish. Does. But nobody you know, does. Yeah, <laughs> but I know that you are a California native, and you do have kind of an interesting history of growing up in, uh, growing up in Ingleside, right? Well, uh, when you are raised near Hollywood, I grew up in Compton. I'm oh, a homie. Compton, even better. That's right. That you're you a homie. Yes. I'm a homie. I'm mm -hmm. I'm bent out of Compton. <laughs> Oh, boom. So bad. Thanks. I'm here all yeah. week. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, however, when you are, grow up near Hollywood, there's an opportunity to work in the television and film industry, and it's it's legal child labor. And so um, my brother and I and some of my uh, you know schoolmates and all were assigned to the Screen Children's Guild, and it was kind of like, um, you know, uh an agency that would contract, a, you know, the background kids are doing, you'd be like an extra or you could move up, you know, if you had the talent or whatever. But if we did that for a few years and, and so worked on TV and film and stuff. And, and, uh, and that was my first exposure to production, film mm -hmm. production and, and television production. It was fascinating. And I was uh, totally into that, and I would prefer to hang with the cameraman and the sound people and and watch what they were doing, and they'd explain what they were doing. I'm eight years so you, old, you by were, the way. You were drawn to tech at a very early age. Very early age, like and then they'd say, cue the kids, and I'd go, oh, shoot, I've got to leave, and, and they said, can I come back? And they'd say, yeah, you can come back. And so that was, uh, and my brother also, uh, we both were very fascinated by that, and so I studied film initially, but was... Um, uh, very much into music all my life. Mm -hmm. I have. Um, so were um, you a musician as well? Did you take music at all? Well, early? yeah, I was. Uh, Compton school system had a fantastic program, um, and so they had uh, art and music and modern math and things like that in the schools, mm -hmm. and so they had what was called um, Compton Festival Orchestra that all the kids in the um, school system, the different elementary schools, uh, which each had their own 
um, bands and orchestra. We were an orchestra. Started at eight years old playing the flute and orchestra in the schools. And then you auditioned to be in festival orchestra, which met on, if you were, you know, chosen, um, Saturday mornings at eight, from eight to 10, we would all play together. And then we often did, um, uh, big shows and, and competitions with other school systems. We and we always got, you know, medals and blue ribbons. We made records. Um, my first recording is a Compton a Festival Orchestra, and so that's where I learned all of those skills. But you got into the technical stuff at the same time that you got into the music. Musical that's stuff. unusual. I had both those things going, mm. and my family was musical, and. Um, uh, my mother and my aunt had sung on the radio a little bit on um, Cliffy Stone's Town Hall Party. Ooh. Yeah. And, um, that sounds exciting. As the Wilson sisters. Uh -huh. and um, Yeah, we're going to get into that in a minute. Yeah. Too. And and then, uh, so there was always music. I always loved music. I always loved breaking it down. And, you know, mm -hmm. and then my oldest brother, uh, who's 13 years older than, than me, um, he got a job at Jams Electronics that uh, some of the older techs, like Dave Hampton, knows all about it, uh, in Compton. And he had a bench. He was like 16, and I was three. And he would bring home amps and tube things and whatever to fix. And so, and I idolized him, and I loved hanging out at his feet while he worked on stuff, and he'd show me stuff. And so one of my favorite smells, comfort smells, to this day is uh, tubes warming up. I love it. <laughs> okay, so let's also talk about, you know, you mentioned the Wilson sisters, and I know that this is an interesting anecdote, uh, discovering, discovering your relatives. Yeah, well, um, growing up, my mother's from Hutchinson, Kansas, and, and so we had a you know, a lot of relatives there, but a lot of them came to Southern California. And uh, so every um, couple times a year, we would have Wilson family picnics. And so we'd all get together. And um, when I was about eight or nine, um, uh, I was such a fan of the Beach Boys. I was like, Little Surfer Girl was written for me and all of that. And I was just a huge fan. And uh, so... Um, few years later, when I was 13, we went back to Kansas um, for my grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary, and a, a lot of the Wilsons all came back there, and um, uh, I was there um, listening to the older uncles and all talking, and they were very concerned that uh, Dennis Wilson was, was hanging out with Charlie Manson. And I'm playing with younger cousins and whatever and being 13 and cocky. I said, well, what do you care about that? And he said, they upturned to me and he said, he's your cousin. And I just, uh, you know, froze. And I said, what? what? And yeah, it turns out um, their dad, Murray Wilson, uh, is uh, was first cousins or something close like that with uh, everybody uh, growing up in Kansas and he was such a troublemaker that none of them liked to play with him but they were forced to every weekend at grandma's um, farm so when the Wilson migration to the west coast happened none of them contacted him none of them hung they didn't have to hang out with him anymore and so we had moved to Torrance. We had other relatives, Wilson's living in Redondo Beach, and then the um, Murray Wilson and his boys lived in Hawthorne. All these cities are right next to each of other. Of course, yeah. Right next to each other. And we never knew that they were our relatives. So I flipped out in Kansas, couldn't wait to get home, but I was there for two weeks. And while I was there, we are driving around because there's nothing else to do in Hutchinson, Kansas, uh, with the neighbors. And on the radio, this new Beach Boys song was playing called God Only Knows. And on maximum rotation, it was just every time we got in the car to drive around, it played at least once. And 
So I couldn't wait to get home to my little girlfriends and and finally do. And I said, guess what? Guess what? The Beach Boys are my cousins. The Beach Boys are my cousins. You know, we're not mm-hmm. first cousins or anything. But um, and then I said, and and that, what about that great new song? You know, oh, I just love God only knows. And they all said, what? What? And I said, what do you mean, what? The new Beach Boys song, it, it's playing in Kansas. It, it said, well, it, we haven't heard it here yet. And it turns out Murray Wilson, being their manager, test marketed all the Beach Boys songs in Hutchinson, Kansas. Doesn't surprise me. Yeah, and so. Where, where is surfing more of a mystery, <laughs> right? Right. So let's fast forward a little yeah. bit now. I want to talk about your beginnings in the studio because that's that's also a fun story. It's a real fun story. And um, my my boyfriend, we started going steady at 12, and he was a musician. Mm. Yes. Well, we were together from 12 to 24. His name's Robert wow. Fleischman. Yeah. And we took a little break, short break, but we got back together. That's impressive. Um, anyway, he was a... a Real good singer and musician had a band at, at thirteen, and and uh, I would. I'm getting sit- visions of um, what's the song? Another Pleasant Valley Sunday. Oh, you know? <laughs> yes. Well, um, the Garage Band. And, yeah, you know, and I would sit on the stool in front of the drum kit. Dino Madaloni, who's the studio owner now and a great drummer, um, he was in the band, and um, I would sit on the kitchen stool in front of the kick drum so the drum kit wouldn't keep moving forward. So I know all the drum figures for Sunshine of Your Love and, you know, all those sort of songs. But they played and at the Teenage Fair. you got a real feel for Fair. the kick, right? No, well, <laughs> literally. And um, anyway, so he was a musician, and and um, later on, uh, his guitar player, Roger, uh, when I was in film school, um, like 18 years old or 19, I was going to Long Beach State in USC, and um, Roger said, hey, um, I've got this gig engineering for Leon Russell, um, and he has a home studio, so you you should come over. Well, that was another, like, um, stunning yeah, let's thing see, this to hear. Been, this would have been like the Mad Dogs and Englishmen era, or? It was right after his solo record. Uh-huh. Uh, but I uh, and I so was. So people knew who he was. Oh my gosh! He was anonymous yes. for a number of years. Well, before he he was emerged, with uh, so uh, people who knew him knew Asylum Choir sure. with Mark Benno, but yeah. also he was in the Wrecking Crew. And, well, and that's what I'm thinking because yeah. when he was in the Wrecking Crew, I mean, most of those guys were kind of anonymous. You know, Hal Blaine kind didn't, of, didn't yeah. get known until years later. Right. But once he did the Asylum Choir stuff, that's when. And he then he like, got into Mad Dogs beard, and you know? Englishmen, yeah. and uh, then he did his solo stuff. And I was an enormous fan, and on PBS they had this special that uh, Leon Russell and Friends mm-hmm. that I watched religiously over and over as many times as they showed it. I was just, I, and played his records like crazy, and, and um, loved his piano style, you know, that was so gospel-driven, oh, yeah. and, yeah. and his great unique voice and his songs mm-hmm. were just so incredible so so needless to say you uh you I, accepted the when, invite when uh after school ended that day i went home and then drove to encino where he was living and had moved he also had a studio in in uh, tulsa called the church which was a real church but he had bought this house that was Lou Costello's old house Ooh. of Abbott and Costello and Lou had died there and so that was kind of like woo but it was this cool mid-century house and and so I'm all excited so I go there and walk up the walk and ring the doorbell and and Leon actually answered the door and I almost fainted and uh and because <laughs> I uh, just expected staff right with, of course you know and he said, oh, you must be Roger's friend. Come on in. And uh, my legs were just shaking. And um, But I heard in this huge foyer uh, to the right where a dining room was supposed to be, uh, all this great music was coming out. And um, 21 tracks of background vocals of Mary McCrary singing on Ooh. this song called um, 
Will of the Wisp. Uh-huh. Uh, no, Hideaway. It's Hideaway was the song. Okay. And um, because Leon, it turns out he had a Stevens 40 track tape machine in there. He had turned the dining room into a control room. Of course. And I had like never really yeah. been in a recording studio. I didn't know that those things were you know that that you could do that for a living but anyway I, I go in I follow the music and I see a console and I see the tape machines and I see the outboard gear and I see the monitors and I hear this fabulous music coming out and I said to Roger uh, show me how to work this this is it I had my epiphany I uh, the angels were singing yep I know that feeling. And, and, we all uh, know that feeling. Literally, the yep. sh they were singing. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, the next day, I dropped out of uh, film school and found a recording school, which wasn't very easy because mm -hmm. there weren't very many. There weren't a lot of them back no. then. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, sound Masters at Sherwood Oaks Experimental College. It was upstairs, and, you know, it was one of those mm -hmm. um, thrown together sure. things. Uh, anyway, I signed up for that and then told my parents what I'd done. And and actually, I got Were their blessing. Okay. I was very fortunate, but it wouldn't have mattered. I would have done it anyway. Sure. Um, so that worked out well. But in those days, most of the learning was actually done in the room here. You know. Well, yes, yes. Um, I mean, you it got was your just, basic signal flow no. and theory, maybe. Yeah. And then, you know, if you were lucky, you got a gig in a studio and you started learning by just basically watching over people's right. shoulders. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, you start out cleaning toilets and making yeah. coffee and cleaning out the fridge and, and then, you know, hopefully you could observe and they would, you know, try to teach you. Um, but there was this school and, and so it was, uh, me and 50 guys. And, um, the first night they're just, He's just talking about audio. He's talking about um, phase and complex waveforms and Doppler effect and and velocity and amplitude and and uh, limiting and compressing and and EQ and all these words that and but not demonstrating any of that or any. And I I panicked and I went, oh my God, I've I've really blown it. Um, I haven't a clue what he's talking about. Uh, I made a huge mistake. Get on a payphone, remember payphones, and just called Roger at Leon's, just ah, 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 crying and saying, "I don't know what he's talking about." All this stuff. He says, "Come over." So the next day, since I wasn't in university anymore, um, it was a Monday night. So Tuesday, I go over to Leon's, and Roger. It's early, and so. He greets me, and Roger's like 18, and he's saying, okay, this is an 1176 limiter. This is what limiting sounds like. This is, Here's an LA-2A. Here's a compression, and here's what gating sounds like. And here's EQ, you know. And all of a sudden, slowly, it all made sense, Yeah, right? and he let me play with it. And so, so from then on, um, I would go to school Monday and Wednesday nights, and then Tuesdays and Thursdays, I would go over to Leon's <laughs> house and uh, and practice what I had learned, and I could record my boyfriend Robert's band with, you know, and and it, so I was very fortunate, and Leon was yeah. very generous to allow me to do that before, you know, because they didn't start working till like two o'clock or something, and there were a bunch of people around this kind of compound. You know, it was like a family, mm -hmm. and uh, different people would be there, um, you know, Joe Cocker would be there sometimes and George Harrison would be there sometimes uh -huh. and um, a few other people but uh, the uh, cool thing was that I had this advantage to not only just go to school and not have a safety net of you know a school environment I had a real studio I got to Proof practice in yeah. and mm -hmm. um, it's important that the little sidecar about Roger. Yes, I was going to lead you to that. Uh, we must reveal who Roger Yes, well, is. Roger at that time, he was like 18, and I think I was 19. And um, uh, he was working on what he likes to call his little invention, which um, uh, his name is Roger Lynn, and he invented the Lindrum. And he was working on it while, during this time. And uh, so, uh, so you were surrounded by some uh, fairly competent minds, shall we say? 
Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I was so driven and myopic once I discovered that you mean people make a living making records. This is and this is how it's done, and you you can do this. Uh, I was um, from that point on. I I was uh, unstoppable, and anytime somebody tried to say, well, you know, girls don't do this, or there's not enough jobs for anything, all the things they say now, mm -hmm. I would just say, I don't I don't need you to tell me no. I need you to tell me how. So if you're going to tell me no, then bye. Yeah, somebody and, else will tell and me And how, how about you? Hugh, yeah, can yeah. you tell me how? And enough people did. And and uh, uh, I think because I was so sincere and passionate about doing it and, you know, showed up mm -hmm. and applied myself and, and uh, it, uh, they responded. Yeah. And so I was very fortunate. And it never occurred to me that, it was something a girl didn't do, but you know, I didn't know anybody did it to begin with, so it didn't occur to me that that was something only guys did. What I think is interesting about that is also that it wasn't that you had to have this stance of, I'm a girl and defending the fact that you were a girl. It was more like just the fact that you were fascinated with what you were doing, you were really into it, and it's like you were willing to work. And that, I think, is the big thing. You know, what What I think is sad is the way women are treated in the industry. But what I think is, well, sometimes. Okay, not always. But, yeah. but what I think is really interesting to me is that, for the most part, people who approach it from a gender agnostic position fare better. And what I mean by that is, you know, I'm not hiring you because you're a girl or in spite of the fact that you're a girl, I'm hiring an engineer or whatever role yeah. it is. And I don't care what your gender is. I care if you're good enough to do the job. Yes. You know? And I think that is, that is the approach that I wish we all could have. You know, I mean, I know there's a lot of gender politics and everything like that, but you know, you made it, you made your way by being good at what you did. Not mm -hmm. because, you know, respect me, I'm a girl, or not, you know, get out of my way, I'm a girl, or anything like that. It's just, I'm a person, I'm here to do a job. I knew immediately and always, uh, playing the girl card was only going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew, well, I just knew I wanted to be the best at what I did. And um, it wasn't so much competition, it was that... I knew I had to be kind of twice as good to get half the recognition, uh -huh. and um, at that time I was okay with that. I already knew that was kind of the standard. It was there were so few women in in studios here at the Village Studios, um, which was then called the Village Recorders. Um, the owner, Jordy Hormel, had this great idea that he felt that women would be an enormous asset in the studio, in the control room, on the production team, because he, you know, maybe this is sexist, I don't know, uh, but he felt uh, women typically, in his eyes, uh, had better organizational skills, had better, you know, we could take better notes, which was, you know, there wasn't any automation back then. So we had to document all the settings on all the upward gear, on all the, um, you know, the EQs on the console, all this sort of stuff. Uh, if the tape boxes, take, keeping sure. track of, you know, Recall the takes and the Polaroid. false starts and, yeah. and all of those sort of things. So um, uh, he felt we had better organizational skills, that, um, uh, that we were a little more nurturing than guys would be, um, and uh, that was more of, it wasn't meaning a negative thing or a salacious thing, it was just being that we were uh, more tuned into the vibe that was going on there, and that our egos would not interfere with um, what was going on in, in the studio. We wouldn't try to compete with the engineer or we weren't trying to take over or mm -hmm. whatever that we knew to be quiet and listen. And, and um, I think 
taking the best aspects of that, um, those ideas uh, really had a lot to do with the success of the studio because the four women who were here, uh, there was one woman, Terry Becker, who was here um, two months before I got hired. I got hired the same day Barbara Isaac got hired as an assistant. And then three months later, Carla Frederick got hired. Now, all four of us started here at the village and all went on to do um, great things as audio engineers. And uh, our opportunities here and the quality of the um, music and professionalism and the equipment and the studios and the talent, all of that was as good as it could get. And so we were a part of that. And, uh, and so we were supportive of each other. And there were two male assistants as well. So there were a total of six here. And um, I had no other point of reference. Uh -huh. I did not know that other studios didn't do that. So was The Village your first gig? Yes. Ah. I graduated from Soundmasters. Uh, one cool thing about Soundmasters, too, because they didn't have um, an actual classroom or, you know, brick and mortar school with a, you know, let's build a control room for the school. Um, we would have lecture for three weeks and then we would have lab for three weeks. And so the labs were uh, at Capitol. Sure, they booked studios. a studio for it. They booked yeah. an, a proper studio, yeah. a Capitol or Conway, mm -hmm. were the two where um, we would practice those things. And then the next day, of course, I still was going to Leon's house. Yeah, you had the advantage of Leon's. I had, Leon was uh, so important to my success, I think, and for me to be able to move up, because this is an acquired skill. Oh, no question. You, you don't get the nuances. You don't get any of that from YouTube. You can get basic information, basic recording techniques, but then you have to apply them and practice, 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 and learn what all those really mean. And it's subtle. And it's subtle and it's ever changing. Ever changing. You know, and depending unique on what to sound the you're starting with. And yes. Yeah. So during my three years as an assistant here, um, I got to work with the best engineers on the best music, with the best producers, and the best studio with the best equipment. Mm -hmm. That was my goal, and I achieved it. And thank, I am so thankful to Gary Starr, who was in charge of the assistants and kind of studio manager. He's the one who hired me and helped me because even though I was learning at Leon's, boy, when I got in here... Uh, the one thing you learn when you get out of school is how much you don't know. Oh, of course. Even of course. though I knew, I was fortunate to know more than a lot of people, but I still, there was so much I didn't know. Well, and the other thing that I think is important here is that it's not just the recording aspect of it that you're learning. What you're learning in the studio is the human aspect, the psychology, the creative process, the, you know, and, it, and, you know, everybody says it's all, you know, and it, it's true that one needs to learn when to keep their mouth shut and things like uh -huh. that. But it's also more than that. There is a certain give and take. There's an ebb and flow between people, between, you know, the energy and the psychology of different people. And all of that is stuff that you will never learn through theory. You yeah. know, those are the things that come out by virtue of being in a session or being in a hundred sessions. Yes. And, and I think that's part of it too, is that there is so much of this that is an art that is ever changing. Yes. And that's why I think what is the most valuable is not to be able to be in a session, but to be in many, many sessions with yes. different people, not just different equipment, but different human and production situations yes. and yes. styles of music and different instrumentation and different um, different personalities absolutely all of those things you start uh putting together your own toolbox and so you'll say boy i love how al schmidt did this and you know no eq and um 
I love how, you know, Ken Kelly did this or Richard Dashett did or mm -hmm. um, one particular session of story I will tell you about because we all get, um, you know, you want to work with certain people and, and yes. just the best of the best were coming through here. Yes. And so we would, you know, say, well, I want to work on this, I want to work on this. But often you were, you know, brought in, you say, today you're working with so-and-so, today you're working with so-and-so. You look on the list and you see where and you're going. And they yeah. say where you're going. And, and uh, you know, I'd been here for about a year and a half and been on a lot of sessions, like with the band and Steely Dan and, uh, you know, jazz sessions and all sorts of things. And um, they've said, you're working with Debbie Boone today. And uh, Debbie Boone it was Pat Boone's Pat's daughter, daughter if, yes. for those who are too young to know, mm -hmm. um, and had one of the most ubiquitous overplayed hits that ever happened called You Light Up My Life. Every oh, wedding I had it. about that. Every, oh. I mean, it was played to death. It was. It was painful. It yes. was painful. And it was just like, and so, I'm, oh, I'm, I don't want to work with Debbie Boone. You know, that was, so. The situation of the session was this. She needed to sing 10 vocals between noon that one day until 6 a.m. the next morning because she was leaving on a six-month tour starting in Japan. And they were going to pick her up at the studio that morning, and she would... Wow. After singing 10 vocals, she would be flying off to Japan. So you better get it right. And her producer was, um, oh, God. I'll think of it in a, in a second. It'll come to me because it was right on. The, just, you know, went away. Anyway, he was fantastic. And he brought us all together, the three of us that were going to be in the room, the engineer, myself, and there was one other person. And um, he said, I need all of us to work together on this. We have no wiggle room. I, I need your support. Um, and um, he said, uh, Brooks Arthur. Thank ah. God. I can't believe Oh, I legendary. Remember. Yeah. Brooks Arthur. Mm -hmm. He gave us responsibility, showed us respect. He said, I need for her to only see me. The lights are down, so please stay on the other side. Uh, watch her, you know, run the tape machine, all this, but we have no wiggle room. And so I went, okay. And so um, I saw and learned how he worked with her and how professional she was. And I had been on so many other sessions where there's a lot of partying, there's lots of stuff at different vibes. I learned more from that session about production, inspiring a, a, a vocal, a vocal performance, mm -hmm. capturing a vocal performance, keeping the vibe up, keeping all of this. I saw how professional Debbie Boone was. She would sing, you know, it'd be three in the morning. She would uh, rest while we played back and listened and say, okay, we'll punch you in here. We'll do this. She got them all done. Never made a peep, never complained, drank her tea. Uh, six o'clock, the limo showed up. She'd finished her vocals. She left. I was stunned. I have never written, I had never written a fan letter until that session. That's impressive. And I wrote her a fan letter and told her how much the session taught me and how much I learned and how impressed I was and how grateful I was to have assisted her on this. The ones you least expect, right? Yes. So I always like to share that story with others because you just never know. And it's always a lesson. You're always going to learn something about something, even if it's, I will never treat somebody like I just got treated, or I will never treat anybody like he treated that person. I think that's one of the wonderful things about being able to work in the studio is being able to glean all of this information and all this knowledge, and not just the technical stuff, but really oh. the crisis management, the keeping the energy up. 
the, keeping the vibe yeah. happening, keeping the flow, especially as an assistant. Um, the assistant has the hardest job. Yes. Because they have to be there first. They're the last ones to leave. And their whole, they're the liaison between the studio and the production yes. um, team in in Make in the, the technical studio. invisible. So, yes, but mm -hmm. also you... Number one thing is to keep that flow going. You know, never yeah. interrupt that creative flow. And also, you represent the studio. Mm -hmm. So um, you're the eyes and ears of the studio manager. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's a very delicate, um, intimate environment. Mm -hmm. And one of, one of the things that was so important back then, and still with studios on, of this caliber, is that... Nobody came in that door. No client came in that door who had not already proven that they were worth investing in because they had the talent, the music, whatever. So those record deals and all of that, the, the quality and the level of musicianship and, uh, you know, recording, yeah. all the production, all those things were at a certain level before they even came in that door yeah, before you roll tape you know that you're that getting you know, you're... the greatest session players and yes the most professional i recall the first time i set up a session for a guitar player that only people in the industry have really heard of a guy named dean parks oh <laughs> but you know if you say dean parks to you know somebody in a supermarket they're going to say who right but dean was legendary and i i had heard yeah. of him mm -hmm. and then i watched him work and I thought to myself, okay, that's why you get the calls because yeah. they are people who have, you know, uh, CJ Vanston is another one. And yeah, and I had CJ. this conversation oh, too. You know, my gosh. It, ha it comes from, and I, I will quote him on this, it comes from having a vocabulary. Yes. And not just a verbal vocabulary, but a musical vocabulary too, to where you can oh, reach into your so quiver important. and you can pull out any arrow you need and you can really just nail it. Yes. The first time I had a guitar player ask me, can you make my guitar sound a little more brown? Mm-hmm. You know? And I actually... That's an was, EQ setting. Yeah, exactly. And I Maybe I a little compression. Yeah. I understood exactly what he meant. Mm -hmm. and, I gave, and he said, yeah, thanks. You know? And, and I think that's one of the things that also comes from just, you know, it's the 10,000 hours. It's the 10,000 yeah. hours that you put yeah. towards becoming good. Yes. You know? It's it's the twenty year overnight success thing. Yes, you know you only glean that from really doing these things over well, and over. Well, and that that's the thing. You know, you really are in the trenches, and and getting out of school, that was just uh, the part one of your education. Yeah, you know that set you up to be able to get a job mm -hmm. like this, and then you start at the bottom. I was assisting assistants. Now I don't know what they call them now, but I was at the very beginning, put to just observe what the assistant did, and the assistant would show me how the village yeah. wanted things done. In the and, UK, they called them tea boys, I believe. Well, but I was in the room. Mm -hmm. I wasn't waiting outside yeah. Yeah. all the time. But, of course, I made coffee. Of course, I chopped vegetables. Of course, mm -hmm. I did, you know, whatever was required to keep the session flowing. It's a service industry. Yes. So you provide the service that that client is expecting and deserves and actually go a little over. You, yes, you know, that's one of the things too. That keeps them coming back. One of the things that I feel is important about doing these, doing these interviews with people is that we're talking to a whole new generation. Yes. And I would like to be able to pass to that generation a certain wisdom that is not just about Oh yeah, when we recorded so and so, we yeah, did the, you know, yeah, and you know, a lot of what you and I learned in those trenches, you know, it's like a lot of the younger students will, you know, now they'll say, well, you know, the studio life isn't like that anymore, which it's not, and yeah. you know, things have changed and everything, but I think there are a lot of things that are universal and that I still hold too. true, and those are the things that I hope that we as um, I don't know, elders, so to speak, can pass along is that kind of wisdom of it's still a creative process. Oh, absolutely. I'm still making records. Mm -hmm. uh, and but has the process changed? 
Well, the technology has changed, but my interaction with the artists, not so much. Not that's, at all. That's um, the point I want to get to. It's still um, what I do, my job as a producer and engineer, and I'm not that kind of producer that makes beats and all that. That's a different kind of producer. Um, I, when I produce vocals, I'm, I'm working with the singer, and I am inspiring and capturing uh, a performance. To me, it's about keeping that energy up. And for me, the kind of music that makes sense for me to record, I'm not so much into quantizing um, and a bunch of samples and all of that. I'm My pleasure as the artist that I am as an engineer and producer is working with musicians and the creative process and applying my creative skills this is this console is the one of the instruments that I play and, and provides the palette that I paint with, mm -hmm. and um, the monitors and interpreting uh, technically as an engineer what the producer emotionally is conveying. So I wear both hats, and um, and you just said something really important too, the artist that you are as an engineer producer, and I think that's something that needs to be acknowledged is that not only is it an art form in itself, but it's an art form that by its nature intersects with the art form of the people we're recording yes. and working with. Yes. And that's, you know, it's like everything that is being recorded onto a record is also being filtered through the lens of the engineer and the producer and the decisions that we make sitting here have so much bearing on the end product, not just in terms of, you know, what EQ did I use and stuff, but how did I interact with that person? How did I help them to bring that vision yes. out into the world? And I think that's, to me, that is really so golden. Oh, absolutely. Well, uh, what I've be come to realize is uh, during this pandemic, when we've all been able to get introspective about what is this thing that I do, and <laughs> because I was going 100 miles an hour like so many of us were doing all the time, and so to you know slam on our brakes and take this time to um, reflect is how I used it. My, my whole... Uh, MO for this time off has been, I want to emerge from this better than I went in. Uh -huh. So I've been using this time preparing for the reveal because there will be a reveal and it's starting to reveal itself. Um, however, um, it was so important that what I realized was for me as an artist, I see myself as an artist and I choose this medium to work in. Uh, this is how I like to work. I prefer hands-on tactile. Um, yes, of course, Pro Tools. Yes, of, of, you know, I'm, I've taught myself some logic. I've done, mm -hmm. you know, um, different uh, DAWs and all of that. But my favorite fun thing is still recording analog tape for the challenges, for the creative aspect of it for the totally destructive um, idea of it. I want to capture uh, that performance. Uh, if there's any warts, those warts are sometimes beautiful, yes. you know, and knowing the difference. Um, Piper Payne did an article recently for Tape Op Magazine, and she coined a word that I had to write her immediately and tell her Piper Payne is an incredible yeah, yeah. mastering engineer, mm -hmm. fabulous human being. And, and she talked about her way of mastering, how it was somatic. I had not thought oh, of it in those terms, but that yeah. is exactly how I engineer. Somatic meaning you have a physical response yes. to something you're hearing or whatever that lets me know I got it right. When people say, well, you know, yeah. what's your formula? Your neck stand up. Yeah. How do yeah. you, you know, how do you mic your drums or, you know, what's the EQ you use on this or vocals or anything like that? And I've never been very good at formulas. I have basic places I will start like microphones. I 
start using, but also I experiment with other mics and I do different things. But the ultimate result that I'm trying to achieve is that somatic reaction where I know it's right because I feel it in my gut. I feel it, uh, you know, in this part of my body when the bass sounds good, this part of my body when the drums are right, this part when everything comes together. I just, it's a physical knowledge. And it's a shared knowledge too, because when you're yes. in a session and it's right like that, everyone feels that. Yes. Yes. And the responsibility I have with all of this is knowing how to use it well enough to get to where I want to go fast enough because yes, I don't want to lose that moment. Yeah. And um, I'm not the kind of engineer, never have been that, uh, you know, it's, it's like I love fast cars and I love driving and I love all of that, but I have no interest in rebuilding my engine or replacing my gasket or tuning my spark plugs or uh, anything like that. Um, I, I know how to drive that car to take me where I want to go. Mm-hmm. That's what I use that car for. These are my vehicles. This is the vehicles, the, the cars I like to drive, the palette I like to paint with, the instrument I like to play. And um, that's how I feel about it. And I am uh, not trying to please everybody or thinking I, you know, um, you want to do a record this way or you want to use this sort of technology or all that. Um, I don't know if I'm the right person for your project, but there are other people who are. But if um, people seek me out because they like the way I want to work and the way I like to produce and um, the formats I like to use and the style, you know, it's it's like it's any artist. Yeah. It's and the whole so package. It's my individual thumbprint or mm -hmm. uh, stamp on what it is I want to do. Um, and I have embraced that more as opposed to being just a cog in the wheel or, you know, I am an engineer and, and I will do this project and do this. I have to love that thing I'm working on. I have to uh, like the people I'm working with. I have to like the music. And I need to be able to record it the way that makes me happy. Well, you know, it's funny you mention that because, for example, there are engineers who have a reputation for, oh, I want to work with that engineer because of their drum sound or whatever it mm -hmm. is, you know. But then there are stories about people wanting to work with that engineer and the chemistry is just not right. Yeah. You know? And so I think it really is a combination of so many moving parts where you have the dynamics of all the artists involved. You have the dynamics of you as an engineer, mm -hmm. you as a producer, you as an artist, you as a human being, you know, and yes. all of those things. I mean, it's really, it's, it's like a marriage. You it's know? totally like a marriage and you're making this baby. Yeah. And, and so there has to be chemistry. If, for me, since I have choices, what I learned here um, as an assistant, I worked with so many different people and I got to develop uh, what worked well for me as well as me for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has been really important. I went through a phase as an engineer when I first started engineering that uh, I worked for someone else and I worked on a lot of records that I d didn't relate to, and I never had that passion for, but that was my job. Mm -hmm. And it was not fulfilling, and it wasn't how I wanted to do it. And I'm, I'm not saying this to sound elitist, I just was being realistic here. It wasn't the joy of twiddling knobs for me. Yeah. It was the joy of creating music that made a difference, made me cry, gave me goosebumps. Um, I needed to have that. So that's, you know, um, maybe I'm not the, the biggest businesswoman engineer there is around, but I love the projects that I'm working on now. And it's because I, those things have to be in place. So I'm, I'm actually, 
usually hear the music first, going, oh, my God, I didn't, you know, mm. end up at a club. That's the thing I miss so much. You know, so many of my favorite projects that I've worked on was uh, um, somebody invited me down to hear their band play or somebody or yeah. somebody yeah. else was going or whatever. And it'd be like, oh, I don't know. OK, I'll go. And, and uh, boy, oh, boy, did they. Yeah. end up being the and, best and thing I ever did. You just can't wait till the set's over so you can go back there and talk and, to them and, and say, I want yes. to bring you in the studio. Yes, and yeah. uh, I, one of the projects is called Primal Kings. I, uh, before we locked down, I was uh, able to make an all um, analog vinyl record, no digital, recorded to two-inch tape, mixed to half-inch tape. Ron McMaster over Capitol cut the vinyl from the half-inch. Um, we were the last band that he did wow. cutting off of tape uh -huh. before they closed down the mastering. It. Yeah, so that was pretty wonderful. But the joy of that, I went down to hear the band because my friend was in it. And I go, oh, I need to go see his band, you know, just to be a good friend. Just to be supportive, yeah. And, man, I was blown away. So I told them afterwards and you know immediately we were all just like whoa this is so great to meet you and i said if you ever want to make a record let me know and about a year later i got the call and mm -hmm. um yeah we want to do an, an all analog record and let's do it and boy lucky me and we'd already established that there was chemistry i love all the guys in the band uh -huh. um the music i loved blues roots all of that, and and I got to do it the way I wanted to do it, to tape, fast. Um, they were, you know, the singer is so great. He's a one-take wonder, you know. I love that. Yeah, a yeah. real singer. Mm -hmm. um, and the songs were well-crafted. Uh, the guitar player was out of this world. Bass player, unbelievable. Drummer, you know. And they worked well together. That's oh, the yes. Main thing. Oh, yeah. yes. And it was just such a joy to be a part of that. And the energy was so thick in the room and luscious. Um, and we're still, uh, you know, it, it's many years since we started that because it was, a, in, a, you know, an independent project mm -hmm. um, personally financed by various people. And, uh, but, boy, we didn't cut corners anywhere. They built me EMT plates oh, in our own studio. They asked what I wanted, and fun. I said, I'd love some plate reverb. And so instead of buying it, they built it. Nice. I have two. Um, want just stuff like that. that uh -huh. And that appeals to me. That may not appeal to anybody else. That style and those things, this is what brings me joy, and it's my life, and I want to be happy. <laughs> Absolutely. And you know what? If it contributed to creating a work of art that you can be proud of, you know, to me, that's the definition of success. It's yes. not about, you know, it's not about how much money you've made. It's not about how, how thing, things charted or how famous it is. It's about, do you feel yes. proud of this? Can you play it? I mean, I've, I've worked on records that have never seen the light of day, but yeah. I'll still play them to somebody. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I'll feel, you know, a little bit sad that this particular artist didn't make it. But, you know, it's, as you say, it's really about doing what you're proud of and we, what makes you happy. Yes, this record we are all so proud of. We're not sure how this pandemic has uh, impacted the future of this vinyl record because mm -hmm. it, we got it right at close down. Um, so it's like I just relaxed and said, you know, we'll deal with this when we can. Right, right now is not the time. Yeah. So it's on hold and... Uh, I'm, I'm fine with that because I know, I know how good it is. Mm -hmm. And um, if nothing else ever happens, I know how good it is. You know how good it is, and you know what the experience was of making And I know this. how great these guys are, and they're so proactive and just wonderful. So that's what it's about for for me at this time. And I just want to encourage people: if you're doing something that you don't like, uh, go do something else because you only have one one time on this earth and you it's up to you to make the choices that make you happy because that's your ultimate goal is to have a happy life and whatever that takes because i did have a goal 
before, um, early on, I wanted to be the first woman to make a platinum album, and because nobody had done it yet, and uh, and I had an opportunity to do that, and I did it, and it was great. But there were so many convoluted things that up leading up to it. I got very ill with cancer, mm -hmm. and um, the day after I mastered. The, the record, it was for Blondie, his auto-American, and with Rapture as the first hit rap song with music. Uh, I got to engineer that. And that whole record, I adore that record. And I was Mike Chapman's engineer, and very complex, uh, convoluted individual, a genius. Uh, Some say had, a tortured had, genius. Yeah, had, you mm -hmm. know, Real double-edged sword, and I'm not saying anything he wouldn't say himself. I learned so much from him. He did, you know, um, The Knack and, and Blondie and Susie Quattro, and he produced all of those in England, a pop, and wrote a lot of the mm -hmm. hit songs and, and all. And I learned so much about production from him uh, as well that I apply now. And uh, we worked very well together on that Auto American album, And uh, but I was really sick and went into a cancer clinic the day after I mastered it and the doctor said quit your job or die and because of the stress and the pressure and you know it would it almost killed me and I knew that could never happen again and yet it caused you it made you slow down it made you come to a point where you realized if I don't do what makes me happy yeah then why am I here yeah if and I uh, think, you yeah. know, you're right I mean you put your finger on it when you said, you know, you have one life, mm -hmm. you got one go around here, and if you're not doing what makes you happy, it's go okay do to what, go yeah. and find something that does. Mm -hmm. Just because you thought that one thing was going to make you happy, because I wasn't particularly happy during that period before the record. Mm -hmm. um, that record actually was a wonderful experience, wild and crazy. Everything was wild and crazy then. Uh, but Debbie was unbelievable, Debbie Harry. Uh, and she would cook me um, brown rice and, and steamed vegetables. And, mm. you know, she was macrobiotic. And and uh, she was so helpful. And, and I just adore that woman. Uh, anyway, got me through it. And have a hit record. And um, very proud of that record. But I had to take an early retirement. I didn't work for about eight years. Um, I would call that more of a hiatus than a retirement. A hiatus, yes. you did yes. come back, and you came back yes. even more strong. Yeah. Lenny Spent, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Daniel. This is such a treat, especially with... Absolutely. This is so much fun, and I really appreciate it. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.